in a minute or two. <laughs> but, um, when they come, feel free to get yourself a cup. But today I'm happy to introduce John Perkins. Many of you are familiar with John because he's been here at EBI as a visiting scholar this year, and he's been working on two projects. One is looking at the history of the debates about the risks of nuclear power in the 1950s and 1980s, and the second project is to improve energy education in undergraduate and master's level programs. In his previous work, uh, which is as an environmental historian, he published two books, Insects, Insects Experts in the Insecticide Crisis in 1982, and Geopolitics in the Green Revolution in 1997. These books outline the origins, respectively, of integrated pest management, um, IPM, as many people know it, for insect control, and the origins of the Green Revolution for reproduction. In recent invited book chapters, he's written papers that explore the possible impacts of the development of the biofuels industry on IPM in the American Midwest, and on the relationship of the Green Revolution in rice to energy and biofuels. He's got his, he received his PhD from Harvard in biology, and he did his postdoc work there. And over the past 40 years, John has worked as an administrator and or a professor at the National Research Council at Miami University of Ohio and at the Evergreen State College in Washington State. And he's um, emeritus of the faculty at Evergreen State. And he notes that his only and very remote, remote connection to bio, biology of biofuels comes from the fact that, his envi that the environmental organism for his dissertation Schizophilum community. Schizophilum community. <laughs> is a uh, wood rotting good city of mine. And at the time of his doctoral work, however, absolutely no one thought of, about the fact that uh, they must have some sort of cellular activity. So he'd be pleased if somebody could bring up to date on that. And with that, I'll turn things over to John. Thanks, Mara. Uh, and thank you all for coming. And um, when the coffee comes and the cookies come, please uh, just get up and go get them. And uh, I told Mara the, the only trepidation I have is starting a talk at this time in the afternoon without your caffeine jolt. So uh, the burden is very heavy on me. Um, OK. Let me first give you the story in brief. Um, all energy sources have benefits and they have risks. All of them, not a single exception. Uh, I'm going to focus mostly on nuclear energy, which went through a great period of turmoil, 1957 roughly to roughly 1979. Uh, one can play with those dates before and after, but the, the, this period of about 20 some years is where I think the most important events lie. And it's the period when the American nuclear power industry as we know it today really came into existence. Now, during this time, there was a lot of concern about the safety of nuclear power, and that's really what the story is about. And with great gnashing of teeth, the Atomic Energy Commission brought forth a new way to, they hoped, understand risk and safety. It was probabilistic risk analysis, or risk assessment. Uh, and this is really the story of PRA's birth and some of the lessons that uh, can come from it. So uh, what I'll try to do today, uh, first of all, I want to lay out uh, the way I think is useful to look at the energy economy. Uh, and I've kind of used the word dance uh, as a metaphor throughout. Uh, what technology are we going to dance with? Uh, who dances with whom? I'll then turn to nuclear power, give you some background there. And then I want to go into the battle over safety which is mostly going to be between 1957 and then March 27, 1979. The March 27th is a very important date, because on March 28th, something else happened and the world changed. Uh, then I'll try to draw some conclusions about the safety of nuclear power uh, and how, what I think was really driving uh, the discussions. And at the end, I want to end with some speculations about uh, what, if any, lessons are there for people who are working on biomass and biofuels. Are there any parallels? Or all, are there just uh, not? Uh, and that's a question I'd actually like to get some feedback from you on. And then um, the, the eternal question, and so what technology are we going to use in the future for energy? Well, first, uh, visualizing the dance. Uh, I would suggest there are three different ways of laying out how to look at uh, the issue of energy and different kinds of fuels. Uh, one way is what I call fuelism. It's looking one fuel at a time. 
This is extraordinarily useful, absolutely essential if you're doing technical work to try to make that fuel work or to develop that fuel. That's really the whole reason that EBI exists, to, to work on biofuels. Uh, and it does, of necessity, bring blinders. I don't think you can actually do some of the technical work unless at certain times you just put on the blinders and say, I'm going to focus on the fuel. Stepping one level up, I think there's a way of looking at energy flows through the entire energy economy. This is trying to look at all energy sources and the potential interchanges between them. And it begins to open up questions about context, the context in which energy exists. And then finally, there's the work that historians do, energy and context over time. Uh, historians will always tell you that history matters. It matters who did what, when, where, why, and raising the question, and does it still matter? Is there something we can learn? Or has the situation changed so much that actually, no, there's not much we can learn. It's just kind of interesting old stuff. Uh, I think most historians you'll find uh, actually probably like this uh, quote from William Faulkner, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. Now this is a way of sort of intoning very seriously that historians have, m they must have something useful to say. It can also be taken as the mantra for the Full Employment Act of historians to keep them busy uh, at doing various things. So let's look uh, at uh, this second level up, the, an energy flow chart. Uh, most of you have probably seen these things. The uh, Lawrence Livermore uh, Laboratory has done, um, I think, a tremendous job in putting them together. And I particularly like them because, as I uh, often like to argue, uh, this was for 1902 or 2002, kind of a snapshot of what the U.S. energy economy looked like. In that year, we burned 97 quads. A quad is a 10 to the 15th BTUs, and so all of the energy sources, uh, petroleum, coal, gas, uh, biomass, hydro, uh, photovoltaic, photo uh, concentrating. Um, uh, let's see, this one's, uh, oh, they've got the hydro separated out here, nuclear, and uh, then uh, some electrical imports. All of them are expressed in quads, so it reduces all energy to one kind of unit. On the right side, you see all the sources of where the U.S. draws its energy. Uh, on the left, on, the, on this side, you see what we did with it. Uh, we made electricity. Uh, we put it into residential commercial use. We put it into industrial use. And we put it into transport and some non-fuel uses. And then in the center, there's kind of a lot of uh, inner transformations and different fuels going, particularly in minor amounts, uh, to different places. But of course, what comes out of this very quickly is, ah, well, petroleum, as we know, goes largely for transport. Uh, coal goes largely into electricity. There are some minor uses of coal industrially uh, and uh, still some in the residential commercial. Uh, nuclear, of course, goes all into electricity. Gas uh, has a lot of residential commercial use. Uh, quite a bit's going into to, um, electricity now. Uh, very little of it goes into transport, but uh, uh, there uh, is potential for that. Uh, so this starts to open up questions. Well, why do we make use of certain fuels for certain purpose? Why not others? In theory, any fuel can be used for any purpose. In practicality, of course, there are reasons why we use petroleum for transport and coal for electricity uh, and so forth. And of course, nuclear uh, is um, its basically only uh, use is to make electricity. And the, um, the, the graphic also shows that uh, although this is what we want, the useful energy work, uh, out of our 97 quads, we get about 35 quads of useful energy, and then uh, lost as heat uh, is quite a chunk of, uh, of our quads essentially uh, go out into the environment just as uh, waste heat. Well, <coughs> um, this graphic is going to change. 
uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and I'm not going to go really into a great deal of depth on these things. I'll just give you a little bit of them. But for climate change, uh, the peaking of conventional low-cost oil production and the political insecurity of oil, possibly of other fuels, we're going to see some changes in the future. In the year 2100, that Lawrence Livermore energy flow chart is not going to look the same as it looks today. And there's also population growth, which is constantly changing the equation, and I'm not going to say too much about population growth in this talk, but it's there. Well, climate change, I don't think I need to belabor with this group. Uh, the carbon dioxide from petroleum, coal, and gas, uh, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Uh, it's in the atmosphere. It um, absorbs infrared radiation. It keeps heat within the atmosphere. And um, it's amazing what you can find on uh, Microsoft's clip art uh, collection, but I thought this uh, poor old drying up, cracking in the mud uh, earth was an interesting uh, metaphorical uh, representation of climate change. The peak oil uh, business. Uh, essentially, the argument is that um, we, are, we have exploited and we are at the peak of our ability to pump inexpensive conventional oil from the ground and that uh, the in inexpensive, easy to get out oil uh, will decline. It's not that the o there isn't more oil there, there's quite a bit more oil there, but we, can't, we won't be able to get it out of the ground any faster. I'm not gonna try to explain all the arguments about whether peak oil does or doesn't exist. Uh, I personally think it's more likely to exist than not and we should act accordingly. Uh, but uh, there are strenuous arguments whether it does or, or not. And uh, one thing about peak oil, it, it draws out apocalyptic versions, of uh, visions, and it, uh, you can get quite a lot of arguments uh, about whether the glass is half full or half empty and, and what it means. But I think the peak oil business is going to be one of those factors that is forcing change in the energy economy. And then the third factor, the political insecurity of oil. It, this is a very simple graphic from the Energy Information Administration uh, showing back to the uh, late 1940s for the United States. And it shows that uh, our production uh, peaked in about 1970 and it's been on a slow decline uh, since then. Uh, but our imports have gone up rapidly and we are consuming vastly more than we produce. And most of this oil comes from areas that, um, for one reason or another, have a lot of political instability and are pumped by companies or countries that don't necessarily think that the United States is the greatest thing since sliced bread. The United States is not the only country that suffers uh, petroleum insecurity. Uh, we happen to worry more about our insecurity than we worry about other countries' insecurity. But in fact, there are quite a few countries that are consuming a great deal more than they can possibly produce, and they have this same problem. And uh, the constant cries for energy independence usually focus on, well, can't we get out from underneath uh, the burden of depending on foreign oil? So I think we're going to remake the energy economy. And again, there are a couple of ways you can look at it. One can be very rational, scientific. Uh, let's compare the fuels and make choices. We have various methods. We can do cost-benefit analysis, life cycle assessment, environmental impact assessments, energy return on energy investment. We can do national security analyses. We can do policy studies. And then we'll sit down and rationally discuss with one another what to do, and we'll make a choice, and it will be all so neat and tidy. That's one way to do it. Well, this is the way we'll probably do it. Uh, I, I don't know that there's a word in English, so I had to invent a phrase which I call political economic techno hurly burly. Uh, this is basically unleashing the tremendous creative capacity of capitalism. It basically says to an entrepreneur if you get a bright idea, do the research and development, get the patents, 
get the government to give you the proper subsidy and tax system. Get the pricing system so it works in your favor. Uh, if you can get mandated markets through things like renewable fuel standards, that's great. Uh, analyze the return on investment. If you see something positive and you're willing to take the risk, uh, you go for it, you invest, and if you're successful, you get profits, you become a stakeholder, a partisan, uh, and then a lot of arguments are likely to ensue. Because, in fact, different entrepreneurs will come up with different technologies, there will be competition, there will be lobbying campaigns to make sure all this part of the story is correct, uh, and that, in fact, uh, the lobbying will be to perpetuate those companies which have achieved success uh, to perpetuate their ability to have further success. Now customers, as long as they get the benefits and as long as they let their natural inertia that, gee, if it works now, let's just continue working with it. Uh, but customers are kind of fickle and they especially get fickle if they think the technology is going to lead to war, bankruptcy, or uh, some sort of catastrophe. Uh, this is not messy. This is the making of sausage in the political arena. And my view of energy is that this is basically how our energy economy works. Government policy is always a contender, and it usually, this is where the real action uh, is hammered out uh, in the political arena. Uh, so uh, I think that's the context we're in. And what I want to do now is come back and look at nuclear power, uh, particularly in this 1957 to 1979 uh, period. And uh, it's this one little piece up here. Uh, if you, this was 2002. If you looked at uh, 2009, 2008, uh, 2010, the, these, the graphic is going to be much different. Uh, it'll be about the same. Now nuclear is very interesting because the nuclear industry advocates that is it an answer to climate change? And they say absolutely. It is the answer to climate change. Uh, I did a little extraordinarily rough back of the envelope calculations. You add up all the quads that we currently get, uh, this was from 2007 figures out of fossil fuels, uh, nuclear and the renewables. And this year, this was the peak year uh, for energy use in the U.S. And because of the financial collapse, it dropped down about uh, a couple of quads down. Um, but many of the targets for climate change say, well, we've got to get rid of about 80 percent of the carbon dioxide. So I just took 80% of the quads. And this is a very rough calculation. It doesn't count the fact that if you cut coal more, you could keep a few more quads. But I thought it was good enough for order of magnitude. And if nuclear, you, if you assume that it truly is uh, no carbon emissions, which is not quite right, but it's uh, uh, OK. And I gave renewables total uh, the same total blank check and said, well, let's assume they're not carbon emitters either. It's not quite right. But these are just very rough. At any rate, to go from 101 quads to 32 would be quite a drop. Uh, and something would have to happen. And when you look at nuclear, you say, well, it's the biggest, after the fossil fuels, it's the biggest contender. It has an established industry. It has an established technology. It has an established government regulatory structure. Why don't we just use it more? And we'll ramp it up. And if we have to cut this down to this, then we'll take this and push it up, and this will go up too. And that's how uh, we can solve our problem, isn't it? Well, the problem that nuclear faces is that it has had a continuing series of debates about is it safe or is it safe enough? And I want to sort of emphasize here the question of safe and safe enough are really quite different questions. And they require different kinds of answers. But just a little of the background. Uh, of course, the energy out of nuclear power comes from a neutron hitting a uranium atom. And the uranium atom kind of gets upset and starts wobbling. And pop, it goes apart. 
into daughter products, which then become the waste products of nuclear fission, and two or three neutrons come out, plus one big wallop of, of energy. Uh, the energy out of each fissioning atom is a, a very high amount of 200 million electron volts. Now, all of th this picture was put together essentially by Lisa Meitner in Germany. Uh, well, actually, sh as she was a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany who had already fled to Sweden when she did the work, but her former colleagues Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann uh, they were bombarding uranium with neutrons and they discovered in the reaction that there was barium at the end of the bombardment. And they said, where did the barium come from? And it was Lisa Meitner who said, the uranium atom fissioned. That's where the barium came from. One of the daughter products was barium. And uh, many people you know, give Lisa Meitner a tremendous amount of credit for one of the most interesting scientific concepts ever uh, put forth. Now, that was Germany, 1939. Uh, I won't go into the long story, but uh, it's a familiar one. The first practical uses of nuclear energy came very, very rapidly under extraordinary wartime conditions. Uh, the United States was, of course, the first to exploit this as a technology for weapons. In 1945, the USSR followed rather quickly in 49, the UK in 52. Uh, so the weapons came first, but from the very beginning, uh, physicists realized there's a lot of heat, and with heat, you might make electric power because you can boil water. Uh, the USA, in a very small experimental uh, format, uh, showed this was possible in 51. USSR was uh, first with, uh, you know, a more of a commercial scale electric power generation, the UK uh, uh, second, and then the US was third with a fully blown commercial application in 1957. Uh, there were quite a few reactors built. Uh, most of ours uh, turned out to settle on uh, the design of using light water reactors. Uh, boiling water and pressurized water. I'll say a few more things about those in just a minute. But first I want to talk about the political arena within which this technology developed because it's extraordinarily important in the argument about safety. You have to understand the political context or the argument about safety just doesn't make any sense. In 1946, uh, civilians took control of the nuclear energy field uh, and it was a government monopoly. But there was bipartisan support very early, in the er, late 1940s, early 1950s, both Democrats and Republicans wanted to bring private industry into working on nuclear power. Uh, President Eisenhower in his Adams for Peace speech really sort of uh, launched uh, the successful movement through Congress of a revised Atomic Energy Act in 1954 which basically kept the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, pretty much in charge, but it said we're going to develop in the United States nuclear power through private industry. The United States was the only country that fully embraced virtually all of its nuclear power going to be in private hands. The USSR, the UK, later France, uh, other countries that have come along have had a much more either straight government operation or uh, more of an equal government uh, uh, private industry partnership, uh, but we went for very heavy emphasis on private industry. This raised the safety question in a very interesting way though, because a private company with not nearly the resources of the U.S. government looked at nuclear technology and said, well we think it's safe enough and we'd like to do it, but we know that if those radioactive daughter products got out, the accident would be catastrophic. We can't take that risk. So one of the first things Congress had to do after 1954 to make private industry real in the nuclear field was to essentially pass an act, uh, the Price-Anderson Act, it's still with us today, that essentially indemnifies private industry from their damages going over a certain level. And in fact, the private industry was quite clear back in 1956, 57, when this was being debated. 
If government doesn't indemnify us, we will not develop the technology, period. Well, as part of this whole act, uh, getting this act, uh, uh, that's where the first safety studies began to come. As soon as the act was passed, the shipping port, Pennsylvania, the first uh, power plant in the U.S. to go commercial, went uh, very quickly after that to deliver power to the grid. And uh, really the big push to get industry really going on nuclear power came with a report in 1962 uh, where the Atomic Energy reported to President Kennedy, we must have the Atomic Energy Commission acting as a very vigorous promoter of private nuclear development. And in fact, that is what came to pass. But back to the safety issues. Well, let me talk about reactors first, just to give a sort of a, a brief a sketch. Reactors are basically places where you can have controlled, slow amounts of nuclear fission, boil water, make steam, and make electricity. Uh, the components include a core with fuel rods, moderator, and coolant. Uh, there are, for safety purposes, uh, if the coolant is lost, this can create a serious accident, a loss of coolant accident, and there have to be emergency cooling systems that, uh, that keep the reactor core from getting too hot and melting. There have to be control rods that can stop the fission process. And then you put the whole business inside a really tight uh, concrete and steel building to contain anything that might get out of the reactor core, and that keeps the radioactive waste well controlled. And then, of course, you have turbines and generators uh, that uh, make the electricity. And um, I found this lovely animation of a pressurized water reactor. And essentially, the reactor core over here, the control rods are out, the fission is going on. Uh, there's water uh, that pumps around and around in what's called the primary loop. This water gets very hot, goes to a, a heat exchanger. And the heat exchanger takes water in, makes steam, turns the turbine, which returns uh, to, um, uh, to do the thing again. And then there's a cooling here to get rid of the waste heat. And out of all this, of course, comes electricity, which is what we all want. So what about safety? Uh, let me give you the overview, the 20-year the overview. First point. There is no one, not one single person, who said, oh, there's no problem with safety of nuclear reactors. Every person who ever worked on them was quite clear, if those radioactive fission products got out, they were very, very dangerous. The engineers and physicists <coughs> who worked on this also knew that even after the fission stops, there is waste heat generation, which is quite a lot of waste heat. Uh, it's, in the, uh, th it's in the millions of watts of just pure thermal power that can do a great deal of damage even after the fission stops. And the first thing that if you don't want those waste products to get out, you have to keep the fuel from melting uh, because the fuel is in little pellets about that big uh, and that big around, um, that, that tall. And as long as the pellets remain intact, the fission products are largely in there. And then they're in tubes. So if any gets out of the pellet, it's in the tube. And then the tube is in a big pressure vessel. And so if any gets out of the, the fuel rod, it's still in the pressure vessel, and so on. So if you just keep the fuel from melting, uh, you can avoid uh, almost surely these products getting out. And so the Atomic Energy Commission and the nuclear uh, engineers went to what they call defense in depth. First of all, you design, construct, operate, and maintain for maximum safety. In other words, be careful. Second, redundancy. Uh, clating that holds the pellets, the pressure vellets, vessels that hold the fuel rods with the clating, the containment building that holds the vessel. Then you put in engineered safety features, for example, the emergency core cooling system, very key part of the whole business. Then you think about, well, what's the worst that could happen? And so you imagine the maximum credible accident. 
And what the original sense was that you would not subject the public to a dose greater than something that you considered acceptable. So the Atomic Energy Commission went through a great deal of study in the late 1950s, and they decided that essentially as long as nobody gets over 300 rems uh, in their thyroid or 25 rems whole body radiation, uh, that's in the acceptable, it's okay. Uh, background, we get, a, at the, the time, we got about 0.2 rems per year, and uh, the LD50, the, the dose that would kill 50% of people, uh, is somewhere between 250 to 500 whole body radiation. So how did you keep this dose down to the acceptable level? Two ways. First of all, you put the reactor in a remote place, far, far away. And that alone, uh, if something gets out and a cloud drifts towards populated areas, it gets diluted enough by the time it gets to the populated areas, there's, it's, uh, it's no longer unacceptable. If you want to move it closer, then you have to have engineered safety features. And there was a tremendous amount of language in this, these early studies that basically said the best professional judgment of the engineers is these things are safe enough. We know. Uh, also called best professional judgment, or BPJ, or somewhat more cynically, it's trust us. Um, we know what we're doing, and we're very smart, and you're not so smart, and so just trust us, we know, we know it, how to work it. Well, okay, so the safety studies begin, 1957. Why? Because Congress was debating the Price-Anderson Act to limit liability of the nuclear industry, and they asked Brookhaven uh, National Laboratory, part of the AEC complex in uh, Long Island, do a study. What, what kind of dangers are we really working with? And so Brookhaven put out a study, often called WASH 740, Theoretical Possibilities and Consequences of Major acts, Accidents in Large Nuclear Power Plants. And they assumed a 100 to 200 megawatt electric uh, power plant located about 30 miles from a city and well contained in a good containment building. They did not investigate what an accident really was. They simply said it happened. And so the accident was a black box. They had three black boxes and they came up with, well, if the worst happened, you might see 3,400 people killed, 43,000 people injured, $7 billion property damage, uh, mostly on restrictions on agriculture. But the probabilities of this are exceedingly low. Trust us. The Congress did, and even after seeing these figures, they passed Price-Anderson. Uh, and Price-Anderson was passed for the period 57 to 1967. Well, uh, around about the mid-60s, uh, it was time to uh, ask, are we going to renew the Price-Anderson Act again from 67, say, to 77? And Congress asked, well, you want to update uh, WASH 740. Uh, they knew that the technology began to change, the reactors were getting bigger. Uh, maybe uh, it was uh, time to take a new look at this. The, this story has been told well, so I'm not going to dwell on it at great length. It, it's simply to say, the Atomic Energy Commission did not handle this requested update well. It got the request in 64. They turned to Brookhaven again, said, could you please make new calculations? Brookhaven did, and they started to assume not a 100 to 200 megawatt reactor, but 1,000 megawatts, somewhere ten, five to 10 times as big, because that's what the industry was wanting to build. And at various times, they started coming up with numbers like, well, maybe we could envision 45,000 dead, uh, 10,000 to 100,000 square kilometers contaminated. That, at the upper limit, uh, that's about the size of Pennsylvania. $17 billion worth of damage. Uh, AEC kept saying, well, yeah, but what's the probability of the maximum? And Brookhaven, in 1965, said, we can't calculate the probabilities. All we can tell you is the maximum that could happen. Well, these drafts circulated among AEC staff. The staff shared them with industry. And both the industry and a lot of people within the AEC said, oh, 
there could be misunderstandings if you release something that said 45,000 people could die. Well, yeah, I, I, could, I could imagine misunderstandings. The resolution was that AEC said, well, we never completed the study. We found that the damages would be no less than WASH 740. And essentially, they then sat on all the drafts. Uh, it wasn't actually released until uh, the mid, nearly the mid-70s. But Congress continued trusting the Atomic Energy Commission, and they passed, renewed the Price-Anderson Act. But it was hard to keep a study producing figures like this, done with so many people involved, totally secret. Word started to leak out. And I would date the Atomic Energy Commission starting to lose that precious public commodity of trust from this time. There were too many people who knew that, yeah, a lot of work was done, some kind of scary figures came out. And then they consulted with industry and said, whoa, misunderstandings, better not publish that. So they didn't. Uh, and also, uh, and I've read a lot of the internal correspondence of the agency, it's quite clear there started to be some tension within AEC itself. Some of the staff got really restive, particularly in the regulatory uh, aim, and they also felt the development arm of AEC was not producing safety studies that were useful in regulation, and so there was kind of a lot of internal bickering that also became known. So, 1965 sort of started a period of unrest, and then kind of a floodgate of changes just deluged the Atomic Energy Commission. A lot of rapid social changes after 66. The first I want to do is mention Rachel Carson. Uh, environmentalism acquired some real teeth, partly, uh, largely because I think Rachel Carson articulated so beautifully a new philosophy of nature that said, you know, it's really not okay for human beings to do just any old thing they want. Just because an engineer can do it doesn't mean it's right. And this is not a scientific finding. This is a metaphysical, uh, ethical, uh, moral finding. But it resonated with so many people that it really started ushering in a whole new realm of the United States attention to, um, to the environment. In her book, Silent Spring, in fact, she uh, specifically mentions strontium-90 from the uh, uh, atmospheric um, uh, test results uh, of, of nuclear weapons and, of course, DDT, the insecticide. And she basically set up the notion and demonstrated that these two compounds demonstrated that there was global circulation of, of pollutants, that they, you release them in one place and they essentially get everywhere. Uh, part of the reason that the National Environmental Policy Act was passed was Rachel Carson's new sense of how to look at nature. And the National Environmental Policy Act said the federal government shouldn't do anything until it examines the environmental impact. Now, the Atomic Energy Commission said, well, basically it doesn't affect affect us. Uh, we license because we know that these are safe and there's no environmental impact. And they got sued, uh, long story, but uh, to make it short, they got sued and they lost. In fact, the uh, courts scolded AEC uh, quite vigorously and said, it, you've made a mockery of this very important act. And AEC really had to backpedal. And this, ho this whole business Losing that NEPA suit caused a great deal of consternation within the agency. A second thing that happened, this was the era of the war on poverty, the war to bring civil rights to all Americans, the war for women's liberation, the anti-war movement, great social ferment, a lot of non-governmental organizations got started. One in particular, the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, arose at MIT. Uh, started as an anti-Vietnam War kind of issue, anti-ballistic uh, uh, anti missile kind of issue, but soon turned its attention to uh, civilian nuclear power. And they gained great credibility because they had very solid scientists working on the technical details. Another thing that happened, uh, quite a different sort of thing, but in fact, in the early 1970s, U.S. oil production peaked and began to drop 
And this brought energy security into a sharper focus than it had ever been before and again caused great nervousness. Uh, so these were all kind of cooking around in the larger society and they were all impinging on that crucial question, what is safe enough? A lot of technical changes. Larger power plants, they were in fact starting to be built at about 1,000 megawatts. Uh, uh, Indian Point uh, outside of New York City was one that was pretty close. Tremendous variety, mostly pressurized water and boiling water reactors, uh, but still no standard design, so uh, each plant was a kind of uh, one-off uh, plan and uh, the l tremendous work keeping track of all the different plant designs. The utility companies wanted these things near cities. They did not want them to locate way far out uh, because that made transmission costs much higher. But if they were going to be closer to the cities, the ECCS, the Emergency Core Cooling System, it had to work when it was needed. And in the late 60s, there this, were a series of committees in the Atomic Energy Commission that basically began, they began to doubt their own, they didn't, they stopped trusting themselves. They said, we're not sure this stuff is, these things are really going to work. And it came out, uh, this, uh, the metaphor of the China syndrome, if the ECCS doesn't work, that is, the reactor loses its coolant, the co emergency cooling doesn't work, the fuel melts, it melts down, melts out of the pressure vessel, melts through the containment building, and melts all the way through the earth to China. Well, not actually all the way through the earth to China, but it got called the China syndrome because it was the uh, molten fuel going out of control. And in fact, one of the plants that uh, the calculations first showed that if the ECCS doesn't work was Indian Point uh, outside New York City. So 1971, best professional judgment was clearly wobbling. Uh, in April, the Atomic Energy told Congress, we're not sure the emergency core cooling will work. Does this gonna, is this going to block licensing? Well, the, the agency quickly developed some interim acceptance criteria for the emergency core cooling, kept licensing, but all these committees that said we're not sure they're going to work didn't have a whole lot of faith in the interim acceptance criteria. Uh, in October, the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy and the Congress, the Congressional Oversight, asked for some comprehensive reviews on study. They got, they asked for one, they got two. Uh, and then a very unusual step, the Atomic Energy Commission, they were so uncertain about what to do about this uh, emergency core cooling, they said, we'll have a public rulemaking session. We'll invite anybody who's interested to come and testify and then, after we've got all the evidence on the record, then we'll set up some criteria for what is a good licensable core cooling system. This brought the Union of Concerned Scientists into full-blown blow, full blown public exposure because by this time, the Union of Concerned Scientists had hooked up with Ralph Nader, who was a master at public presentations. So, the study reports that came out, I'll try to make this uh, very short. The first study, uh, dubbed WASH 1250 in its numbering system, basically was a recapitulation of uh, the current way they were judging safety, and it was, in some ways, best professional judgments, last hurrah. There wasn't much new here. The second study, uh, dubbed WASH 1400, or the Reactor Safety Study, or the Rasmussen Report, or when it came out in final form from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, had a new kind of number. Uh, it was directed by Norman Rasmussen, a professor of nuclear engineering at MIT, uh, co-directed by Saul Levine, uh, a staff member at the Atomic Energy Commission, and they basically sought to replace best professional judgment with quantitative probabilities. They wanted the ability to compare nuclear with other hazardous things, and they wanted quantitative criteria for safe enough, dubbed probabilistic risk assessment. A three-year study, 60 people involved, 70 man years of work, $4 million. This was not a small effort. This was kind of a really big deal for the 1970s. 
Uh, so probability began to enter the arena. Remember in 57, the Atomic Energy Commission study said you can't know the probabilities. 66, they, the Energy Commission commissioned a study that never got much um, circulation, but it was the first attempt using fault trees. I'll explain what these are in just a second. And then from the, the UK, uh, uh, one, a UK scientist, F.R. Farmer, uh, brought in event trees, and I'll talk about what these are, uh, for sighting. And um, uh, it was particularly important in the UK because the UK basically had no remote sites for a nuclear reactor. They're a very densely populated country. And then the last thing I'll point to in this era was the Chauncey Star, in a very well-cited article in Science Magazine, uh, put forth a quantitative philosophy of risk, which really put out a comprehensive framework for why probability was good uh, for doing comparative risks and a way to determine acceptability of risks. Uh, so this new way, probabilistic risk assessment, the accident's no longer a black box. You can study failures, uh, probability of failure of events from fault trees, accident sequence with event trees, and essentially you get a model of an operating reactor. The old safety said nobody receives a, a dose over a certain amount. The new safety said it's safe enough if the individual's chance of harm drops below a certain level like one in a million. After one in a million, apparently we don't care anything. Uh, because it seems so remote. That, that's the, an issue of still in contention. Just a word about fault trees. Uh, it came from reliability technology, first used in the 60s on, uh, to study Minuteman missile launch systems and how they could fail. You basically diagrammed an engineering system, how it was supposed to work, got all its component parts, figured out failure rates, used Boolean algebra to model the system diagram and the failure rates to get probabilities. And the original plan of Rasmussen was to use fault trees only. And this is what a fault tree looks like. Uh, you, this is something you don't want. Loss of electric power to the engineered safety features. You can get that if you lose AC power or DC power. You can lose AC power if you get both loss of off-site power and uh, loss of on-site power. And so these fault trees, uh, when you express them uh, as a Boolean algebra phrase, allow you to calculate the probability of this. If you know the probability of this, the probability of this, and of these two boxes, you can calculate the probabilities of what you don't want to happen. The event trees. Uh, this was de derived from decision science in business, and uh, they used a couple of reactors to, uh, to get their uh, actual working data. Uh, and they were looking at two kinds of accidents, the loss of coolant and the functioning of the emergency core cooling system, and also would the containment building fail? Those were the two big accidents. Uh, I'll show you what one of these looks like in graphic form in just a minute. Um, but it essentially allowed more complex modeling than fault trees alone. And it was Saul Levine at the AC who said how to put together fault trees and event trees. Well, this is what an event tree looks like. Uh, across the top here, you've got uh, pipe breaks. This is bad because it means the coolant water is going to be lost. Then the electric power could go off. And then the elect emergency core cooling system might not work. And the fission product might not be removed from the containment uh, area, and the containment might fail. Now, a, an event tree is success or failure. Uh, if success happens going up and you get to there, then you've got th the probability uh, of this event, and, but there's no release of radioactivity. And if everything works just fine here, uh, this is going to be close to one. But if the electric power fails, then you get a different series of things. Or if the emergency core cooling system, it could fail here or here, and you'd get problems, and so on and so forth. So you can calculate out each of those probabilities. Now the question is, how do you know the probability of uh, something like this? Well, you go to a fault tree. This is loss of electric power, which you calculate from the fault tree. 
and you go back and essentially hang this fault tree right there to calculate that probability. And the reactor safety study looked at somewhere around 140,000 different combinations of accident sequences and weather conditions and population densities and so on and so forth. So they put together a tremendous number of these event and fault trees to, to study uh, their system. Well, what did they find? Well, first of all, what did Norman Rasmussen say before he was even appointed to run the study? The probability that the ECCS of a reactor will be called upon seems very low, perhaps once, less than once in every 10,000 years. Now, at the time he said this, there were only 9.6 reactor years of experience, and by 1979, we still had only 150, so it was a little dicey to say, well, the probability rate's only one in 10,000. After the study came out, he had a very similar study, a statement that the likelihood of reactor accidents much smaller than many non-nuclear accidents. Well, just a few of the numbers. Uh, the core melt is it's now even less than one in 10,000, it's uh, one in 20,000, and uh, very low probabilities. Probably the ones that, the figures they put forth in the executive summary that, ca that uh, that resonated the most uh, in positively or negatively is essentially an argument that said your chances of being harmed by a nuclear reactor were a little like being harmed by a meteorite. And I think most people would say, well, I don't really worry much about meteors. And so an engineer could say, well, then you shouldn't worry about a nuclear power plant, should you? And the person might then say, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> is that really a good comparison? And that's the problem they had. Uh, and here's, uh, th these are the farmer curves out of after F FR Farmer, basically running the chance of fatalities as a chance of a reactor meltdown. And here was the line that showed nuclear power and um, power and meteorites being very, very similar and much less than other natural causes. And similarly, uh, for man-made causes, nuclear power plants in this study came out really much, much less dangerous. Now, a little bit about the reception. And, uh, ooh, I've got to wrap up <laughs> here fast again. They got a lot of praise. I'd, I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on the praise. A lot of people thought it was terrific work. And they got some barbed critiques, and I'm going to just give you a brief rundown of the four most barbed critiques they got. Uh, first, Hal Lewis, professor of physics, University of California, Santa Barbara, chaired a committee. This went to the American Physics Society. It was not a formal review of WASH 1400, but they said, based on some casual observations, the calculations are probably relative, not absolute. They didn't trust the absolute values. They didn't really think there was a quantitative basis for assessing the uh, reliability of emergency core cooling systems. Well, now that had been the whole point of the study. Uh, so that was kind of a serious criticism. Uh, they thought the long-term health effects were probably larger. The study didn't do sabotage. Lewis said they should. But PRA, the probabilistic risk analysis, was very useful and should be refined. Then it went to the House of Representatives. Uh, there were hearings in June of 76, and the report that came out in 77 said the report was misleading uh, on levels of certainty and levels of comprehensiveness. Now, misleading, I think, is a very polite, very strong word. It's like you want to give a report to your boss, and then a, a year later your boss says, you know, you misled me. I don't think anybody really wants to hear that they're being called misleaders. There's a more uh, stronger term that most people would use, but we'll just use it as misleading. Uh, and the House of Representatives requested a new executive summary done by an independent group reporting directly to the commissioners, bypassing the staff, and it should include dissidents. Well, then the Union of Concerned Scientists weighed in, and they had a number of things. I'll just uh, talk about a couple of these. First of all, they thought the accident sequences were incomplete. They agreed the values were relative, not absolute. Incomplete knowledge on component reliability, 
not enough on aging earthquakes or sabotage, long-term health effects underestimated, no attention to groundwater contamination, inadequate review, on and on. The industry misused the executive summary, no basis for choosing am among energy technologies. This is a very powerful critique, which I'll say more about maybe if we get time here. And they said, withdraw the report, so bad. Well, in response to the House report, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission asked uh, Professor Lewis to come back for a second round, and he had a new committee with some of the same people, but some new people. This time they said the report was conscientious and honest. I would hate to think that somebody said the best they could say about my work was it was conscientious and honest. You'd kind of hope that for the given, not the conclusion. They also said the report was inscrutable, not a good word. Uncertainty levels underestimated. Uh, peer review process in, inadequate, executive summary inadequate, but it makes licensing and regulation more rational, so they think they should continue it. And they said, you know, NRC is in a siege mentality, which they, they were. Well, what happened to the whole results? Um, well, the executive summary was withdrawn by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in January 79. And they backed away from it, said, we don't embrace it anymore. I would say just in the nick of time, because in March, Three Mile Island happened. This was an accident that really wasn't supposed to happen. And it really changed the game because it showed, oh, in real life, these things can happen. And Hollywood, bless its heart, just a few months before Three Mile Island happened, Jane Fonda, Michael Douglas, and uh, Peter Fonda, great movie, The China Syndrome. Uh, gave great, uh, it was a, a fictional core meltdown issue. Um, and NRC essentially backed away from using the, the probabilistic risk analysis as a philosophy of regulation and made it uh, just an engineering technique. So let me draw some conclusions. Well, first of all, long story, can't go into it now. The nuclear industry essentially came to a screeching halt by about 1977-78. No new construction uh, started after 78. No new reactors came on after 96. The anti-nuclear movement faded, mostly because no new reactors were being built. Uh, and the first conclusion I would draw is that this WASH 1400, it was a product of controversy. It was a study that was designed to quell the controversy it enraged it. Instead of pouring water on the fire, it poured gasoline on the fire. Uh, numbers, they are necessary, but they're not always persuasive. Sensitivity analysis doesn't play well in the press, doesn't play well in Congress. Uh, and opinions seem to form on other grounds. For example, Norman Rasmussen was convinced before he did the study that nuclear reactors were safe. What did he prove? He proved what he already said. Uh, and I would conclude that probabilistic risk assessment, it's a good technical tool for engineers and regulators, but it is not a philosophy of risk. What were the real drivers? People get wedded to one fuel. And if they know one fuel, they tend to think that fuel is really good. Established industries lobby for self-preservation. The nuclear industry, as does every other industry, does this. There were immense questions of prestige and power. This was not just any technology. This was atomic energy. And all through the 50s, 60s, 70s, the Congress was very aware they were in a race with the Soviet Union. The US had to be first. Uh, after 1970, there were questions of, is this nuclear or is it not a good solution to energy security? Trust in public institutions and private institutions is absolutely key. If that trust is lost, all is lost. Uh, acceptability of risk is very hard to quantify. People have notions of aesthetic beauty. If a nuclear plant is ugly for whatever reason, you're probably not going to like the technology. If it's beautiful because it's an engineering marvel, you probably are going to like it. And then there's Rachel Carson with her visions of nature. Are there any parallels between nuclear and biofuels? Well, nuclear has catastrophic accidents. Uh, TMI was Three Mile Island, a near miss. Chernobyl, not a near miss. 
Uh, still have issues of waste disposal, low-level radioactive releases, water supply issues, uranium supply. Always the plutonium, will it walk away and get into mischievous hands? Uh, and one thing I've noticed about people who advocate for nuclear power, I've never heard them talk about efficiency. Uh, to me, that's a problem. Biofuels, do they have catastro catas catastrophic accidents? Well, none yet. Is that just because we're too early or because they won't happen? I don't know. Uh, historians are no better at predicting the future than anybody else. We all have to make models and make our best guesses. What about other issues? Water supply, fertilizer, and pesticides. I think there are some parallels, and there are issues of risk assessment uh, that have to be done in biofuels. And again, I would go back to, uh, I think these are the things that are going to drive people's attitudes uh, as they look at biofuels and the risks that are posed. And there are some traps. Uh, the techniques that I see being used in the biofuel business are here, and they suffer these same types of dangers. Perhaps the most dangerous one of all are the visions of nature. There's a short way of putting this. Don't cross Rachel Carson. Don't cross the Union of Concerned Scientists. I find it interesting. The Union of Concerned Scientists is very active in making pronouncements about biofuels. They have a track record, and their track record is more successful than not. So whom are we going to dance with? Are we going to dance with nuclear? Are we going to dance with biofuels? Are we going to dance with something else? Uh, how are we going to decide? Is it going to be a lively dance or a very staid, romantic? I'd put my odds on, I think we're into the political, economic, techno hurly-burly. Uh, that's how it's going to be decided. And with that, you've been very patient. If you have questions, comments, and thank you very much. And thanks to EBI for letting me come here. study proven to be true or untrue, saying the chance of a catastrophic accident in one of the 10,000, there's hundreds of reactors on the planet that have been running out for more than 30 years. The How many people have died? Yeah. Not many people have died uh, from Three Mile Island. Uh, there is an argument about whether there's any health consequence. The nuclear industry says no, absolutely no health consequences. There are epidemiologists. Uh, for example, Stephen Wang at the University of North Carolina says, mm, I'm not so sure. We haven't looked very carefully. I think the best test of uh, uh, the, the, the uh, WASH 1400 became a, a Rorzak test. After Three Mile Island, proponents of nuclear power said, well, see, the containment vessel worked. And besides that, Rasmussen actually had the pathway that led to Three Mile Island in one of his accident sequences. So it must mean that the, the study was pretty good. And opponents of nuclear power said, yeah, but this accident wasn't supposed to happen. Therefore, we can't believe WASH 1400 at all. Now, Chernobyl is quite a different case because it was not a reactor of the sort. Uh, it had no containment vessel. It had other safety features that were not present. So I think the real answer to your question is, um, there is still a debate about do you call WASH 1400 true or false? Be That's not what I'm, I'm asking oh. empirically. What is the, the number? It's, it's known, right? It should be known because it's been running for around the world for 30 years, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it can't be quantified. If nothing can be quantified, how can any decisions ever be made? Um, there are debates, quite strenuous debates, about the death toll from Chernobyl. Uh, there are other debates still going on about do the ordinary uh, run-of-the-mill day-to-day releases of radioactivity from nuclear reactors cause harm or not. There are those who say no and other studies say yes, we think we can pick up effects. The answer is it depends on who you ask. Is that, I don't, it's not a... <laughs> if nothing can be quantified and can be trusted because we don't trust the scientists, or we don't trust the government, or we don't trust the company. How can any of this decision making ever be, be uh, really productive if you can always just say we don't trust this one person yeah. or this other person? I think the decisions about nuclear power up to this point have been made largely on qualitative factors. And my 
view of the future, which is my effort to predict the future, is they will continue to be made on qualitative factors and they will consist of such things as a powerful industry has influence in Congress and is able to pass legislation to create a favorable environment for its industry. For the nuclear industry, this is loan guarantees. And the industry says, if we get the loan guarantees, we'll build the plants. How many loan guarantees can they talk out of the Congress? The Congress is not going to look at probabilities of harm and really make the decision, I don't think. They will cite the numbers. And the proponents of the loan guarantees will say, look, the numbers are really low. And the opponents of the loan guarantees will say, you can't trust those numbers. They will make their decision on other grounds. It's not that they don't make decisions. They will, but on other grounds. Um, it was more of a comment, having, having been involved in some of this. <laughs> um, I think the nuclear industry uh, learned the big lesson that, that we have to learn to point out, which is don't let the computer make decisions. Right? Don't let the, the process. And, and that was, and, and actually EPA still makes this mistake with their risk assessment process where they have a procedure and they'll say, well, this is the guideline because we followed our procedure and it says the numbers stay. Uh, and so the, the key phrase you use is that going from risk-based decision making, that is where the risk assessment makes the decision or, or you use it to hide to risk informed decisions. And the, the fascinating thing is that it's been in the US I mean, 120 reactors, 40 years, so we were running five, six thousand years of reactor operated years of no accidents in the US. And part of the reason for that is they learned the magic of adaptive management instead of uh, so so up until Three Mile Island, a nuclear power plant was licensed by a process where if you pass the test, if you got the PRA approved, you're done. Yeah. Now they are constantly, they're in an iterative process, which is I think one of the things we've argued for biofuels mm -hmm. is or other technologies is don't think that you can turn to your LCA or your risk assessment to give you a free ticket to say, you know, you pass the test, you're home free, move yeah. ahead full speed, no, no restrictions. We all have to get into this kind of adaptive thinking, yeah. which actually is fascinating. The nuclear power industry really learned it, but they get no credit for it. That, that's true. I think it's a very good point because, in fact, not only did they learn it, they institutionalized it in the INPO, the Institute for Nuclear Power Plant Operators which is a non-governmental organization owned and controlled by the industry. And it was essentially Three Mile Island that put the fear of God in them. And the leaders of the industry got up and said, if there's one more thing that looks like Three Mile Island, our industry will be shut down. We are all in this together. And through INPO, they do this adaptive management free of government intrusion. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission keeps final decision making, but IMPO is their institutionalized adaptive management mechanism where they can coax each other to keep their plants operating. And I think IMPO deserves a great deal of credit, and maybe biofuels needs its IMPO-like institution where you know, there's a very conscious non-governmental peer review process that points out failures before the government comes in and exercises power that's unpleasant. Yeah. So there are a lot of things about um, the safety of nuclear power plants in the past that they just think about anything like what are you going to do with the nuclear trash? Was this also a big concern or is that you can store it somewhere? Um, during this period that I was talking about, the assumption was that uh, nuclear waste would be reprocessed and the remaining, uh, the plutonium and uh, uranium-235 that was fissionable would be extracted and fed back into the uh, power reactors. Uh, but in the United States, the reprocessing never happened. And uh, so we've now had a period that's approaching 50 years of the waste continuing from reactors of power reactors continuing to accumulate largely stored on site with arguments about whether there is technically a good place to put it or not, but a political stalemate that no state wants to be the nuclear dumping ground. 
And for example, as long as Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader, is in his position as Senate Majority Leader, the state of Nevada and Yucca Mountain will never be the repository for nuclear uh, power plant wastes because Harry Reid doesn't want it. And the Senate Majority Leader can make that decision stick. And no other state seems to be really anxious to step up to the plate to be the place to put all this stuff. There's a very interesting movie that has just come out. I saw it last Friday in San Francisco called Into, Eterni Into Eternity. Uh, it's a Finnish movie about the Finnish uh, disposal of high-level nuclear power wastes. Uh, really good on ethics and government, not so good on technical grounds, but a very powerful movie. It's, I recommend it highly, Into Eternity. Well, I'm sure John will be around to answer any other questions, but let's thank him one more time. Thank you.